Hello, and welcome to the Shan Horse class of 1936. A very interesting class indeed, and probably one of the classes which I spend more time talking about these days than I ever thought I would. I'm not sure what it is about being the it has been about the year of technology, but the year of technology has seemed to me to turn into quite often me talking about German battleship design. I'm sure there are legitimate reasons for why this happened. I just don't know why this happened to happen to me. But it did. And so we are at the Scharnhorst class. Now I'm going to get rid of this window for now. But I'm glad it's working. I'm glad it's working. Scharnhorst class 1936. We often talk about Germany's first aircraft carrier after they, when they have never constructed one before, the Graf Zeppelin, and how many interesting decisions get made in that vessel because of them seeking probably perfect technological solutions to problems which they don't necessarily have to deal with, and which, if are a problem, then they're in a lot of more worse trouble than they think. However, and this is a big however, the Scharnhorst class, they get a lot more right than they get wrong. Yes, there is a good argument that they are fixing the perceived problems of the Scharnhorst class when they build the Bismarcks. That is certainly something I can agree to. I don't think they're affixing the uh, as many of the actual problems of the Scharnhorst class as they actually are, as they think they are. I think there is a real problem in their perception of what their capital ships are for. And I think there's a real problem in their whole strategic plan of what their capital ships are for. And fundamentally, I think Germany is still stuck in the mindset that well, in World War One and running up to World War One, when you look at some of Tirpitz's plans, and occasionally he does catch Jackie Fisher and the Royal Navy off guard. You know, I've talked about that. But as a rule, what they're building are a Germanified, a Germanified version of what the British are building. Without thinking, well, do we need this? Like the British, uh, uh, do we need this? And with the Germans in the 1930s, after the Deutschen class, and let's be honest, the Deutschen class were all they needed for what they were for taking on Gangots and things like that, and dominating the Baltic. They don't, they don't need anything more than the Deutschen class. The Deutschen class will do dominating the Baltic quite happily, and quite capably, because the way they've been modernised, the way they've been upgraded, you know, the way these ships are, and the way they're kept up. The Scharnhorst class are in many ways an evolutionary step between the Deutschlands and the battleships which the Germans think they want. Let me clarify that, think they want. Why am I saying think they want? Because look at it from the actual perspective. If Germany has battleships, if Germany has those vessels, who are they building them to fight? Are they going for another risk fleet scenario versus the Royal Navy? That worked so well last time. British infrastructure and the fact that they don't they can choose to fund their air force and their navy and ignore their army, they can choose that, means that they will always outbuild Germany. Unless Germany invests in masses of infrastructure, and they're not able to because they need to fund their army, they need to fund lots of other projects. So, okay, right then, what's the next thing? Are they being built to fight France? Well, that's rather a stupid scenario, because the Anglo-French alliance is fairly strong. 
any war against France is going to involve Britain. Mainly because Britain defend, depends upon France to be their unsinkable amphibious assault ship in Europe at this point. That's the sort of scenario you're talking about. They can land their troops into Europe if they need to deal with any European issues through France. And France is basically dependent upon Britain to defend its empire, to defend the French empire that is, because of the treaty agreements where they've agreed to be the same size as the Italian navy. So basically France is Britain's loyal supporting act at this point. I know there are going to be French people who really don't mind me saying that, but in terms of strategic processing at this point in 1920s and 30s, France's governments have managed to muck themselves up so much that if they do not have the support of Britain, a huge chunk of their foreign policy collapses. So therefore, the only way they can maintain that support of Britain is if, if Britain just helps jump, they shout how high. And Britain doesn't ever put it so crassly. But it is a problem for the French. They can take a lead on European affairs because they have the army there. But for global affairs, they have to basically back up and do whatever Britain does. And even for European affairs, they have to be careful because if the British choose not to join them, they could find themselves in real trouble. You can argue the same to an extent for the British and the French, but the reality is Britain, by treaty and by level investment, and Lord help us by stability of government, we're in a far firmer, far stronger position than France were. That is not saying the British position was strong. That is saying the French position was massively eroded from where it once was. Legacy of World War I you can certainly claim and certainly make a good case for, but I would also say successive governments of France had failed to grasp any problems and deal with them, instead trying to enact visions of whatever they thought was a beautiful idea. Their own pet projects. And it is that context in which we must consider Germany, because, okay, they're building capital ships. What are they really for, then? Well, the, strategic sen the strategically sensible answer, and the one I would bring up, is because if you're going to fight even a submarine war versus the Royal Navy, you want to give them the threat of other methodologies, so that they have to comp and they have to build to deal with it. If you give the Royal Navy a one-dimensional threat, i.e., you are going to just attack you with submarines because that's all we have, the Royal Navy is going to be very happy. They will literally churn out bitten class till the end of Kingdom Come, whether they're called black swans or whatever they come, uh, they are when the sort of when they orders are given. They'll just churn them out in peacetime. If they think war's coming up, they'll make a war emergency. They'll make a sort of what they would call a war, pre a war preparation procurement, which is what the flower class and hunt class escort destroyers, which were, you know, the flower class were basically what do we fit? Uh, what what is the smallest commercial hull we can fit what we have on a bitten class into, and the hunt class escort destroyers are a bit in hull with more horsepower. But I'm called the destroyer because they can now go faster than the sloop kind of officially. And then you also have the black swan sloops. All came from the same hull. So the bitten and the iterations on the bitten would be ordered en masse. There you go. That's your your problem solved in a submarine war in a where submarines are your only threat. You have you can build more of those than they can build submarines. You can crew those more easily than they can crew submarines because 
you will have a large reservist pool that can operate the various engine types that you're going to have available there. If you go with the Corvettes, they're going to have quadruple, well, four-cylinder triple expansion or quadruple expansion engines, depending on your uh, the exact form of those cylinders and the exact uh, phraseology you wish to refer to go to. The rest will probably have turbines of some sort. Again, your reservists will be able to deal with them. And that leaves your fleet free to go and clobber the Italians or deter the Japanese. Right. So, how do you make that less easy? Well, if you have surface raiders and you have aircraft, long range aircraft that can come out and strike things, okay. Now you need to make sure you have an air defense for your escorts and your convoys because they could come under air attack. And the worst thing to do with aircraft is not be able to fire back because then all they do is they call their buddies and they can come out and they can fly a lot faster than you can move. So they can shadow you, especially if you can't fire at them. And aren't in range of land-based fighters or your own air aircraft carriers to assist you. And then it's surface raiders. Well, your ideal surface raider needs to be powerful enough that you don't want to go one-on-one -on -one with it if you're in a light cruiser. So you're automatically making it to require a heavy cruiser for an even fight and a capital ship for a advantageous fight. Capital ships are of course preferred and the larger the surface raider, the better. Now here is the point of where we get to the Shan Horse class versus the Bismarcks. If you are building a surface raider, it's a capital ship. I know the Shan Horse have 11 inch guns. That does not make them a battle cruiser, by the way. I'll get into the whole battle cruiser versus battleship debate in a second. But. The 11, leaving the 11 inch guns to one side, and they are certainly powerful enough for a surface raider role. You can produce this vessel more easily than you can a larger vessel. It's large enough to justify a capital ship response. It's not so large that it's going to tax you in terms of your production. And that matters. I'd also add something else, and this is before I've even got into any part of this video, any of the pictures, any of the discussion points, the Excel spreadsheet I've got loaded up. You will often hear there's a debate as to whether or not these are vessels are fast battleships or battle cruisers. The debate mostly seems to trace back to Winston Churchill's writing of World War II. Now, I have an interesting time because I, of course, spend my time, a lot of time in the National Archives, with the 2% of the ADM documents, that's Admiralty documents, which survive. 98% went to the shredder. We have indexes for most of the rest of the 98%, so we know what they were, but we just can't read them because they were got rid of because it was felt that no one would warrant, want to read them. I don't know. British government obsessed with preserving 2% of everything. But leaving it to one side. Leaving that to one side. There is a small issue. I've searched high and low. I've only ever seen them referred to as fast battleships. Battleships. Now... Here is the thing. I think there was a time they were probably referred to as battle cruisers, but I don't think it came from the Admiralty side. Or if it did, it came from one a small group within the Admiralty. The point comes when Churchill is trying to pause construction of capital ships and carriers. There is a very important point of clarification. The Royal Navy is saying, well, we can't pause the fast capital ships because we need them to face off against our opponent's fast capital ships. Because they have battle cruisers, but they're building fast battleships. 
If the Shan Horse are designed as fast battleships, you do not want to send your battle cruisers up against them because of their armor and therefore their equivalent firepower and capabilities. They are above them. I'm sure some will now point out that, you know, Hood could beat them or Renown when she's modernized could hold her own against them, and I, I would agree. But battle cruisers have a distinct disadvantage if they get into a slugging match with a fast battleship. That disadvantage is the fact that one is a honeycomb structure, is more of a honeycomb structure, so it's greater subdivision and solubility that way, and usually thicker, better armor, and more armor coverage. Those factors are important. Combine that with a 9, 11 inch guns and their rate of fire versus, and the penetrative capabilities of those particular 11 inch guns versus 6, 15 inch guns or even 8, 15 inch guns and there is something going on. Now if you clar classify them as fast battle ships then the entire argument that the King George V's shouldn't be kept going, or at least you should be, you you can't pause all of them, you should maintain a construction of at least two or three of them to give you a superiority of them, becomes very difficult not to accept because of the way the Royal Navy is structured. The moment they're defined as battle cruisers, though, you already have three in, okay, in purpose. The person who's making the case and pushing for the pause of capital ship and carrier construction is Churchill. The Admiralty is fighting him on it. He's pushing it for uh, them for it because he thinks you need to focus in on escort construction. Because he's remembering the experience of World War I where it was an absolute nightmare to try and force the Admiralty to get escort production going. Whereas in World War II, the Admiralty has largely ordered it as of 1938 and started constructing it in 1939, months before war began. Small difference going on there, just a, just a tad small difference, but that doesn't matter to Churchill's mind because he's sure they must have underappreciated the strength and they need to focus in on the, on the construction. So this becomes a real problem. If they're considered battle cruisers, he doesn't need to build the capital ships. He can pause them. If they're considered for, uh, if he, if they, if they're considered fast battleships, he can't pause the King George V. So, when people put a point to that source for me, when they point to it and go, ah, but the Royal Navy said they were battle cruisers. I'm sorry, I don't agree the Royal Navy did. I don't, I don't, the Royal Navy never seems to any of the records I've read, and I know Winston Churchill, but I don't consider on this to be an unbiased source, because I remember a very famous quote of his, which is definitely attributed to him. I know history will be kind to me, because I intend to write it. I'm actually often think Churchill does the right thing. He, more often than not, he seems to do the right thing, and he's a very good leader, and frankly, in the situation Britain was in, in that period of, well, in the beginning, and for most of World War II, you can't pick someone better of the options available, the viable actual options, to be Prime Minister. There isn't a better one than Churchill. I know, I've looked at them. But I also know he is a man who is focused on legacy and prosper uh, pros posterity. I was going to say prosperity, that too, but posterity in this case. And as such, I don't trust him on this point. I, I would say maybe he found someone in the Admiralty who agreed with him and he quoted them and said that's the Admiralty opinion but I think that would be someone who was in the strong minority from the documents I've read and the strong minority from the people's do uh, from the, do uh, the first hand accounts I've read you have to remember the Royal Navy was whilst they would never have used the words like I do of capital ship spectrum etc that was how they were thinking. 
That was how their naval constructors fought. When they were talking about ships exactly, how they defined them, where they were on the line. And this is why I'm fairly certain when I say things like the G3 are battle cruisers, not fast battleships. Because the Royal Navy thought of battle cruisers, or dren as well, or two word, or dreadnought armoured cruisers as they were originally called. They had a definition, a, a sort of running definition for that in their minds. Then they had battle cruiser one words, so that's battle cruisers which are capable of killing the dreadnought armoured cruisers and still running away from and, and anything else below them and fighting each other but are running away from anything with battleship in the name to, in the name. Then there's fast battleships which are designed to be strong enough to beat anything else in a fight and go toe to toe with a battleship and have a chance but also have the speed to avoid a fight with other battleships if they choose uh, and choose when and how they're going to fight them and battleships which are basically floating blocks of uh, blocks of armored steel with some guns on top designed to take the maximum amount of damage and meet out everything they receive in triplicate under that criteria Sharnhorst class are fast battleships. That's what they were. They were also the first class to be called, known as, and I'm going to check this to make sure I pronounce this properly, as Schlachtenschiff, which is German, the Kriegsmarine, for battleship. Previous battleships have been classified as Leinenschiff, i.e. ships of the line, and Panzerschiff, or armoured ships. The Deutschland class are Panzerschief. So, Schlachtenschief. Shameless book plug. Well, hey. Thank you for everyone who's buying this, and thank you for everyone who supports the channel. You make all this possible. You make everything we do possible. And when I say we, I mean me and the Fluffy Research Assistants. Because that is my entire working team. <laughs> so, here we go. We've got the American assessment. <sighs> Oni 204 Scharnhorst. These are distinctly German looking vessels. They really are. And they have that shape. I often think, looking at them, that They are, to me, what the Deutschlands should have been in many regards, with the free turrets, and in many ways what the Germans should have just been building and just kept building. But getting the Deutschlands through as this would have been politically impossible at the time they were built, so I can understand why that didn't happen. But still, this fits. This is the, what the Germans need. It's got enough firepower to damage anyone. But more importantly, it's got enough speed, mobility and standards to keep it going. And iterating on a design is one of the best ways to simplify a design and make it more economical and get the most efficiency out of your, out of your production. And the Germans don't do that. They don't. So, let's get to the vitals. And it's from there we will also discuss the origins of the design. This goes away, and this should appear. Hello. Welcome to my Excel spreadsheet of, well, it's fairly large. Uh, how good's that for all of you to see? I'm going to make it a bit bigger. I'm going to go to 100%. That's a bit too large because that doesn't, then you can't see everything. 90% should do. And I'm going to make that a little bit smaller so I have more space for my head. Just a tad smaller so I have. I can do this for my head now. 
So. As you can see, this is one of many, many tables I have. I'm a modern naval historian. I have tables and tables of data that I can point to and compare across. And the way you structure your table can be important. This is a data table. It is literally where I dump data. I have lots of tables like this. It is not particularly a shaping or argument creating data set. It is literally for me to be able to do comparisons in a quick and dirty manner and to make sure I have the data stored in a place so I can know I'm using the same data when I'm working on different projects, that I'm not using one source for this and one source for that. So it's compiled from many sources. Many sources have gone into this compilation. With that, let's have a look at them. You'll notice that I've got all four across here, all four of the German capital ships. Why? Why haven't I got a table just of Scharnhorst on the Scharnhorst up? Because you have to, to an extent with the Schlangenschief, treat them as a whole rather than individual. Each one is a part of a story. And whilst the whole story reveals a grand picture, the parts merely illustrate very interesting chapters. There is some standardization going on here in terms of the boilers. Um, I have a debate whether they all use the same boilers, but several sources I have, I've read have claimed that, but as I've got older, I'm more and more suspicious of that. Less suspicious. The thing is, usually I find with the correct turbines are listed in. So it's one of those things. But for Scharnhorst and Tirpitz, both of them had the Brown, Bovary and Company Swiss, that is origin, geared turbines. Neisenau got free from Germania. Bismarck got free from Blom and Voss. It um, always says great things about your country when you have a habit of procuring your better turbines for your capital ships from abroad. They all had variations of the SeaTact radar fitted. They weren't all the same variations, as honestly there are multiple versions going around, but you know, they had the SeaTact. And they all have hydrophones of one type or other fitted. Again, there are modifications. I swear there is part of me which believes that the Germans were constitutionally unable to standardize equipment. I, I just Every time they're putting a new version in, oh, we can make it better this way if we tinker this, this, this. But then you're going to make it completely different parts list from what's fitted on that ship, which is supposed to be a sister ship. Yeah, but it's going to be better. Yeah, but you're going to give your logistics officers a heart attack. Who cares? We'll get more. That's your problem. Nice way. If you keep killing them before they get any experience, you're never going to have decent logistics. Now, you go through their guns. And there is some standardization going on here. One of the interesting things that always pops out to me is that the belt armor on the Scharnhorst is thicker than the belt armor on the Bismarcks. 350mm versus 320mm. Now there are reasons for that, but when you consider the sheer weight differential between the Tirpitz, which is 42,900 tons, and Scharnhorst, which is 32,600 tons. I am not sure why that says 630 that. I have no idea why it said that. Bad typing. I'm 
I'm now wondering how many times I've used these data tables over the years and uh, had put that in there. Or have corrected and forgot to go back and correct the original. Both are equally possible me. But leaving that to one side, 32,600 tons versus 42,900 tons. That's a 10,000 ton difference. That's a 10,000 ton difference. That's a lot. That is a lot. And yet, when we're looking down these capabilities, is Tirpitz worth 10,000 more tons in capabilities compared to Scharnhorst? Size wise, it's 16, actually 16 meters longer. Overall, waterline, mm, 15.6 meters longer. Beam, 6 meters wider. Draft, slightly shallower. That's helpful. A not slur has 1,770 nautical miles more range at 19 knots, but does require 449, no, 349 more sailors, and 49 more officers. Hang on now. 47 more officers. Don't ask me why I said 49. And for that, the advantage you get is two more 105mm guns, a lot more 20mm cannon, two more torpedoes, tubes, and eight 15 inch guns versus nine 11 inch guns. Which, as we know from Nisenau's plan conversion, could be made into six 15 inch guns. So the extra 10,000 tons has bought you the equivalent of an extra turret. And lost you a lot of speed. But bought you almost 2,000 more nautical, nautical miles of range, honestly. And an extra float plane. And why again am I comparing Scharnhorst and Tirpitz? Because they're the two built in the Kriegsmarine Werft in Wilhelmshaven. So they're the two ships which are best here to compare. You're comparing ships produced by the same yard, by the same people. In fact, it's arguable that the reason Scharnhorst's launch when she is, is because they push up the launch as quickly as they possibly can so they can make space and can do the stuff they need to do to the shipyard and the, the place where they're, uh, the, the uh, area where they're building the ships to take turpets. So there is no better ship to compare. Because literally they go from building Sharnos to building Turpets. Ten thousand extra tons buys you an extra turret. And a little bit extra range.
The question as to whether it's worth it is probably something which would have to be asked, asked by a longer term study of German efforts in World War II. But honestly, considering how often Hitler was prepared to use Tirpitz and how long her active career lasted, Probably not. And there's your other problem with all these ships. As good as they are, and there is goodness in them, there are capabilities there. The way they're used in World War II, the way they're in many ways frittered away on solo missions, is absurd. Scharnhorst is lost at North Cape. Why? Because she's off on her own. Yeah, she has some theoretical supporting destroyers which are nowhere to be seen. Neither now survive, uh, doesn't survive the war. She's in harbour being sort of repa repaired and, and modernised or refitted, whatever you want to call it, to take the 15-inch guns. Bismarck of course, is sunk in the North Atlantic, and Tirpitz spends most of the war in fjords, wandering around Norway, being a fleet in being. It ties up British resources, which is useful, and presents the threat of action. And let's be honest, that threat would have been far greater if it had been actually been used. And again, you sort of think, well, imagine if Tirpitz had been available to go with Scharnhorst and had been around for North Cape. Would the British have risked sending the Duke of York to intercept one or two ships? No. They'd have had to wait and concentrate a force, especially if it's Scharnhorst and Tirpitz. They're going to want to concentrate a lot more force against a 15-inch and an 11-inch battleship on battleship. So much of what happens to the Germans' heavy fleet is a product of the way they're used. And yes, you can point out, well, fuel supplies, etc., all these things add up to dictate to the Germans how they're going to use the ships. Yeah, but you can decide to not use them, to store up fuel so you can use them properly. You can delay the gratification of using them until you're prepared to do it properly. And then, of course, the blame is usually put on Hitler. But let's be honest, it's not all on Hitler. Blaming him is the easy way, a scapegoat for all of the German high command. It basically means we did nothing wrong. It was all his fault. We were perfect. If he'd listened to our advice, he'd have won the war. No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. Nice way, the Germans aren't wonders. They can't square a circle. The point being, look at what they've got. The moment you're in a war scenario in, where you're against the Soviet Union, America, and Great Britain, and the rest of the British Empire, you're gone. Sheer laws of mass and cumulative force mean you're gone. You can perhaps blame Hitler for all that, but not quite. It, they weren't his calculations alone. As big an idiot as he was. And trust me, he was one. Uh, I, I think I've described him recently on a television program as being... Um, I think the fr I think the phrase a naval ignoramus was actually not used. I think they used one of my politer terms of phrase about him, but he was. Anyway, back to this. The starting point, I think, for another lot of um, uh, how do I put this ideas that these start the the Scharnhorst were battle cruisers comes from the starting point of designs. The first design in 1928 
did focus on a battlecruiser. A battlecruiser to be armed with eight 12 inch guns in four twin turrets. A design based on that of the Urzat Yorks, which I've already covered in a key ship series. Those had not, of course, ships had not been completed during World War One. But in 1933, when Hitler did come to power, he first actually made clear to the Navy that he wasn't going to build a fleet to challenge British supremacy at sea. Uh, he was focusing on wars with France and protection of German sea lanes. Okay. He wanted vessels, therefore, to augment the Panzerchief, the armoured ships, the Deutschen class. The, he the heavy cruisers with 11 inch guns. These, the tonnage started out at roughly 19,000 tons and were to have the same weaponry and speed as the Panzerchief, with the extra tonnage in comparison to them providing extra protection. Hitler did not like lightly armoured ships. It's where you get some interesting lines about these ships is uh, when some people put forward the argument that these ships would be, those ships, such as those, would be more of a provocation to Britain than battle cruisers. You know, larger battle cruisers with 11 inch guns. As they be, as of course those vessels be regarded as clearly inferior, but that's not quite the case. I know there are some who claim that, and I have read those articles. I would say the reality is Britain wasn't really so bothered about the Deutschland class. I know they get called by pocket battleships and all sorts of things, but it's also realised that the counties can match in with them, that a pair of counties can probably trance them, and that any of the capital ships can catch them and beat them up. And the fact is, they are the Deutschen class are sufficiently slow. And let me clarify that, because it needs to be clarified. They have a top speed of 28 knots. The thing is, the moment they have been out at sea for long enough to actually be on a long-range surface and surface raid, they're going to be slower than that. In other words, at a certain point, they're going to be in the range of where they are catchable by a Queen Elizabeth class. Maybe even a Nelson or Rodney on a good day. For them. Not a good name for the day for the Deutschland. So... Those don't worry Britain that as much. Also, there's the, the fact that you need a certain amount of speed to be able to try to get past the British forces. And it might not sound much, a free knot increase in speed over that. Being able to go 31 knots versus 28 knots. It doesn't sound much. But it adds up to a lot. It adds up to a lot because of its cumulative movement speed. You've got that much further. You've got that much greater range of possible action in terms of time to get to a target. Because the moment you're out raiding in the North Atlantic, you've got a ticking clock as British fleets try to close around you. Range you can cover in terms of distance, that's great, that's fine for the Grass Bay and the River Plate sort of a saga because they have time, they have the space, but even their time is starting to run out, and that's what ultimately does for them. It's time. And you can buy time with speed more than you can with range as a surface radar. However, the French 
had built the Dunkirk. So take advantage, and I've already covered this in so many videos, but I'm going to say this again, to take advantage of the treaty tonnage and the equipment of allowance to provide ships which could deal with potentially older Italian battleships and to also hoover up things like surface raiders. They were fast battleships themselves. This is what led to the Germans pushing for a stronger design. In comes Eric Rader, who also wanted to increase the defensive qualities of the next vessel and to add a third triple turret. The thing is, Hitler keeps agreeing to the increase in armor and subdivision and the increase in armor, but not the increase in armament. It's only in 1934 that he allowed the third turret to be added. And this is when Hitler goes to get the Anglo-German naval agreement. Such an agreement would theoretically guarantee Britain a three-to-one superiority in capital ships and... Well, it removed Britain from being an enforcer of the limitations of the Treaty of Versailles for the German Navy. Because, please note it, how do you enforce a treaty? How do you enforce the Treaty of Versailles? If, if Germany doesn't follow it, you have to declare war on them to enforce it. You can claim it as a casus belli, but... Yeah, shouting out to the British public in 1935, we're going to war because Germany's broken the Treaty of Versailles by laying down two battleships. How many do we have? 16, give or take. We're going to war because they're laying down two? Yes, it's a point of honour. I don't think so. I think you're going to be voted out of power very quickly or face a small rebellion. So, when the British government signed the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, that's kind of the British going, well, we can't enforce the treaty. Because the only way we can enforce it is by declaring war or sanctioning you. And frankly, sanctioning you will involve issues which we'll have to see if everyone's going to be on our side and everyone's got to agree with us to make the sanctions work. And we've got no real international mechanism for doing so because... The League of Nations is even more toothless than the United Nations is. And the other option is we declare war, and we've got no public support for that. So, yeah, we're going to agree to the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. And as such, the improved Deutschlands, which have spent years having their armour and their subdivision upgraded... are allowed their tar extra turrets and a little bit of extra speed. They have a thicker belt than a Bismarck class. They have arguably more balance subdivision than a Bismarck class. They're battleships. Honestly, if Hood had subdivision like that, I would be calling her a fast battleship rather than a battle cruiser. It just... It's almost out of the textbook for what subdivision on a fast battleship should be. Look at the ratio and then compare it to the Iowa's. They're fast battleships. Look at it and go, yeah, fast battleship, subdivision. And the thing about ship design is it's sometimes far easier to read than it is the words written around it and the mythology put around it and you go and look into it and you can tell what is a battle cruiser the example i always give is if you're looking at a design and it looks like a honeycomb it's a battleship if you're looking at a design and it looks like a box of sweets I don't want to truck the boxes or sweets. It's a cruiser. And the variations between are that spectrum. Of sort of that sort of 
that sort of battle cruiser and if you want to expand that beyond the capital ships down to the cruisers and even to extent the destroyers some of them spectrum you can beyond the battle cruisers still good ships Please notice the correct phraseology used here. They're built up guns. That's what the Germans were making at this time. They were building up their guns. That's the methodology they're using. And if, if you go to the video on gun manufacture on this channel, you'll find out about that. So I'm not going to get into that too much here. But there is an advantage of it. If you take your 283mm 52 cal gun that you've got on your Deutschland class heavy cruisers and you go. I'd like to make these better. I would, I'd like to make them battleship level. Well, you can change it. You can build it up a bit more and make it a 54 and a half cal. You can take the latest version of your 28 and turn it into your 34. And the changes, well, the 28 is 48.2 tons. The 34 is 53 point, well, two, five tons. So, about 5.05 tons more. Uh, the 28 is 14.8 meters in length. The 34 is 15.4 meters in length, so it's grown by roughly 600 millimeters. It's a uh, you know a little bit over two caliber uh, two calibers increase. Their rate of fire is roughly equal because the shells are pretty much the same. I mean the. 28 shells were all roughly 300 kilograms in weight, and the 34s, well, the armor piercing is 336, the semi armor piercing is 316, and the igniting is 315 kilograms. But let's be honest, the difference when you're using the systems you're moving for moving around a 300 kilogram shell and moving around a 336, let alone a 315 or 316 kilogram shell, is not going to be that much different. And so the rate of fire is very good. This is an advantage for a surface raider. This is an advantage for a capital ship which is maximizing its capability for minimal cost because this is a minimal cost creation. And yes, the Germans would have preferred, they would have strongly preferred to be able to get some 15 inch guns ready and available. They might have even, if they could have had, he'd have wanted, Hitler would have liked 60 inch guns. But the turrets were available, the guns were available, and the systems for the capital ships which were going to have bigger weapons would take years to develop. He also was reminded, and this is one of the things that often put, is put across, he was reminded the British were historically very sensitive about Germans increasing their gun calibers, sizes. That's a nice way of putting it, but also if you think about it, the British had always jumped ahead of the Germans. So, shouldn't that, couldn't that be the other way around if they jump after the British? It's true, but still, it's putting it from one on the other when both are equally sensitive due to the Anglo-German naval race is a bit over-egging it for me. A bit over-egging it. So what's their service like? Well, 
I've just done Operation Berlin as a video on this channel. Uh, I've got a few more videos coming up, and at some point I should do a Battle of North Cape video if I haven't done one. They have a career and a half. They pack a lot in. They really do. For vessels which are often... Okay, please note. There are people who are passionate about German weaponry and German equipment who are passionately interested in getting the facts right and very interested, and I have a lot of time for those. Then there's a group of those people who have evolved into what are often quickly termed as werboos, where everything German must be universally better than anything else anyone else produced in, in the time period and must be accepted as it. Okay, fine. Don't agree with you, but if that's really your your inclination, you go be you. Just please don't come and have the comps debate with me. It won't be good for you. The next ones beyond that, there are some very interesting sects with uh, sects within that group, which are even more small in number, but even more extreme. The mo the people I see who are most often deriding the service and experience of the Shan horse belong to what I call the Bismarck Boos. Um, if you have a better name and suggestion for them, please do bring it up. I, I would have to. Those are the people who believe that the Bismarck was the ultimate battleship ever conceived. This is a world in which Yamato existed. The Iowa class existed. HMS Nelson and HMS Rodney existed. And Rodney literally sank the Bismarck, so... You know, she would she would like that to be remembered. But, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to argue you are the ultimate battleship in the world, where a battleship which is supposedly you're so much better than that is um, destroyed by you. Uh, but leaving that to one side, Bismarck is the ultimate thing, and they will spend most of their lives, in fact, a large part of their lives, slagging off everything else which isn't Bismarck. This includes Sharnhorst and Tirpitz. And that's another reason why I tend to present them as four ships on a table. Because they should be treated as a group of four. Because the Germans are evolving with each one. And they're each a step in that path. Sometimes they're a step completely off the path into some random area, but they are a step. The Scharnhorst were armoured with the latest and greatest German armour. The best they could get them. And the Scharnhorst were prepared to be risked as a level in service. Prior to Bismarck being sunk, if you were going to say the Germans were risking any capital ships, it was Scharnhorst and Eisenhower. Look at where they're sent. They go after Norway. Yes, Hitler gives me orders to avoid fighting cover capital ships, but in Norway, they're there taking part in the operations. They then are attempting to do variations on Operation Berlin roughly twice before they actually manage to succeed in breaking out in North Atlantic and doing Operation Berlin. And they also do the Channel Dash. When you start to think about it, and think about World War II, Bismarck is the famous battleship for the German Navy, but she literally accomplishes a Golden BB sinking of HMS Hood, gets damaged by Prince of Wales during the fight, then gets holed by a swordfish, which damages her rudder, and propellers, tormented by tribal class destroyers, which I saw someone claiming the other night that she was driving them off with her gun, her secondaries, and speaking as a person who's read all the accounts by the sailors that I want, her secondaries were, had no impact on them at all. I mean, you, if the secondaries were that fierce, I doubt the Polish destroyer would be uh, have, have been signalling I am Polish at them, revealing her position with lights, but, you know, hey-ho. And get sunk. 
then you think about the Shan horse and Eisenhower, and look at all they do. They're, they're also doing raiding against the Arctic convoys. Eisenhower's off being upgraded at 15 inch guns, and Shan horse to fights at the Battle of North Cape, where she gets finally sunk. These are the ships which are used by the German Navy. These are the ships which are actually earning their keep. These are the true fighting ships in terms of capital ships of the Germ of the Kriegsmarine. They do an extensive service. And it's brushed aside so often. The Battle of North Cape is a especially good example because Sharnost is out alone. This is her firing at something else early in her career. Oh yes, of course, they sank HMS Glorious. So they sank an aircraft carrier. I'm trying to think of how many battleships sunk aircraft carriers in World War II. It's not a long list. It really isn't. But no, the Battle of North Cape. To take her out, the British turn up with their own fast battleship, Duke of York. Many cruisers. And many, many destroyers. They reroute two convoys. That's not because this is a weak ship. And she goes down fighting. She has to be ground down. Yes, the Duke of York waits till she gets closer and clobbers her. But that's British doctrine of how you ground down an opponent. That's not because she necessarily needs to get so close to do the clobbering. Remember, the British have engagement range where you blind your opponent. She'd already been blinded by the six inch, by HMS Belfast actually, firing her six inch shells. Had already taken out her radar and a lot of her, a lot of her sensor systems. So yeah, you don't need to do long range engagements to try and blind her. You're now going to get close to decisive range and kill her. And that's what Duke of York does. But she fights hard. She fights hard and makes the Royal Navy work for it. Oh, sorry. One of these key ship series videos is supposed to be 20 minutes. I think the Shan Horse class work because they're in many ways grounded in a lot more thinking a lot more of a thought process and a development program than goes into the Bismarck class. I think the Bismarck suffer from far more cooks involved in the recipe than the Shan Horse and also suffer from the pace of fitting everything new. We've had our own modern experiences of this. If you Look at the Zumwalts, if you look at the la uh, literal combat ships and quite a lot of other designs that have gone on in the world. Where people try to cram everything new into a hull, there has often been problems. Because you need a level of understanding of what you're putting in there before you can make it work with all the other systems. The Scharnhorst were, in many ways, Battleship versions of the Deutschen class. I would argue you can almost look at them as them taking the the Germans taking the experience of building the free Deutschen class and building it up into a fast battleship. Yes, there are some new technologies put in there. But fundamentally they have guns, they understand. They have turrets, they understand. Fundamentally, they have uh, communication systems and weaponry they all understand. So they understand how all that fits together. 
So basically the only stuff where they are taking anything like a risk is the engines. If you look at the rest that goes into the Scharnhorst class, it is tried and trusted technology. Yes, the engines are the interesting variable and boy are they a variable. They really are because whilst both vessels are capable of 31 knots, Sharnos can do 7,100 nautical miles at 19 knots. Neisenauer can do 6,200 nautical miles at 19 knots. That's a major difference within a class. The differential between Bismarck and Tirpit, well, that's 245 nautical miles. That's, I mean, it happens. Honestly, in, when you're dealing with thousands of nautical miles, that's, well, it's not a rounding error, but it's not a major problem. But it's very nearly a thousand nautical miles difference between Scharnhorst and Neisenau. And yes, that is in large part down to the uh, turbines. The Germania turbines were interesting. I think that's the phrase we use to describe them, interesting. But honestly, they are similar enough ships, they should have been far closer. Again, though, it is a symptom of it's your first one you've built. And that is the area where they're experimenting in. And then if you look at the engines which go into Bismarck and Tirpitz, which are evolved versions of the ones in Charnos and Ice now, they're much improved and much closer together. They've learned that technology. They've learnt that. Now they're experimenting, and then you look at the list and go, well, what's they experimenting this time? It's the 15-inch guns. Well, that's what they're changing. They're adding in those guns and those turrets. So, this brings me to... Um, my next point and the question of today. The Sharnos of course have three triple turrets. I have a suspicion that the Bismarcks could have been even more capable and a far more efficient design if they had literally scaled up the Sharnhorse and gone for three triple 15 inch turrets as their formation. However, I do realize the extra beam that would have entailed fitting them with would have caused compli complications in certain areas of operations. So whilst that was a tempting point of view as a question, that's not the one. Neither is the question of should the 11 or should the Shan horse have been iterated upon because that was an entire topic of a patron not that long ago. So, what's the question for this one? The question is quite simple. With the Scharnhorst class being an evolved Deutschland class, and the Bismarcks really being an evolution in some ways, but in other ways starting new under the pressure of the various technologies. If it had been, if the, the Kriegsmarine had not faced the pressure from not just Hitler, but all the various uh, kleptocracy of a government that he had, all the various different compartments and arguments, etc. going on, how do you see a natural evolution of the Shan horse working out into the next generation of battleships. What do you see them looking like? What do you see them as? What do you think would be a natural place for them to go to and evolve to? Thank you very much for watching. I'll be very interested to see your answers to that question. Hope you enjoyed and take care. Deals. Wrong one.